Hello and welcome to The Reasonably Good Life. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brooks, here for episode 17, which is How to Reduce Gun Violence in America, tackling a big and timely topic. And I'm here with my co-host, Patrick Kennedy, who's a UT student uh, studying psychology, uh, perhaps a future psychologist. Is that what it's probably going to be, Patrick? Psychologist, social work, we'll, we'll figure it out for the still, down the line. you still got some time to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so this is our, our 17th episode. We've had a little hiatus, as, uh, you know, done some traveling and also updating equipment here so that the audio quality is hopefully a little better and not painful, at least, for you listeners out there. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so we're taking on this topic at, you know, at the Reasonably Good Life, which is about using reason to pursue the good life in this complicated world. And what we've had recently, and it was last Tuesday, so today is June 2nd that we're recording this. And in Uvalde, Texas, a 18-year-old gunman entered an elementary school and shot and killed 19 elementary school kids tragically as well as two teachers and then just the other day uh, there was another was it Tulsa uh, hospital where uh, there were four people killed in another shooting Um, so and then uh, a week prior to the Uvalde Texas we had in Buffalo a white supremacist go into a was it a grocery store um, and shot and killed um, black Americans and, mm-hmm. and targeting black Americans um, and you know it's just a series of them because this is America and as the satirical paper The Onion had in a headline uh, it no way to prevent this says only nation where this regularly happens um sadly america has all too many uh deaths by gun uh about forty-five thousand a year um 24,000 of those are by suicide so there's more su- suicides by gun than homicides uh, not everybody knows that but it, it, that's where more people die um and uh yeah we've got you know this conversation going again about what to do about the gun violence in america because we keep having these shootings and some are mass shootings like we've had and it seems like every week we're having one and i'm a parent i have three kids my eldest was just finishing or my youngest sorry was just finishing his last week of elementary school when the Uvalde shooting took place and you know is any parent uh, it's just an absolute tragedy I can't even understand you know what what parents are going through I mean it's just an absolute tragedy tragedy the kind of worst nightmare situation and yeah, absolutely um, and yeah. like seeing that in the news after all the previous shootings yeah. I wasn't really shocked when I saw it anymore, and I think that the, the lack of surprise that some people are experiencing um, just shows how, how deep a problem it is that, right. that we're not even shocked anymore Right. Um, in such a developed nation, too, in the United States. Yes. Uh, it's, it's pretty disappointing, right? Yes, exactly, and, and yeah, to your point, it, yeah, a couple things is it's, it's happening so frequently that we're not shocked as much as we should be. Um, where it's like, oh, there's been, have you heard, there's been another shooting. And then, you know, like you were saying that, that we're not, I think America is a great nation. And, you know, uh, but for being such a great nation, to have as many deaths by guns as we do is, is problematic. I mean, we don't want to be an outlier in this, and that's what we are. So there are nations that have more deaths by guns, but that group of nations is a much less developed group of nations where there's, you know, more warfare, more war-torn, you know. We don't want to be in that group. We want to be in a different group where there's very low number of, 
shootings and deaths by guns, but we have more guns in America than we do people. Um, ironically, when there's a mass shooting, there tends to be a run on buying guns uh, because people are afraid they'll be taken away. So at, at any rate, to me, the bottom line is we can do better. We must do better at reducing the gun deaths in America. Like we cannot just keep shrugging our shoulders and saying, well, this is just how it is in America. And, you know, here at the Reasonably Good Life is per using reason to pursue the good life. And it's, it's like, how do we approach this problem in a reasonable way uh, to make some headway? And, and, you know, if you're on the extreme left, you might say, oh, well, let's ban guns, let's do this, that, and the other, and, and we, you know, in an emotional state. And if you're on the right, and you might be like, no, 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 we cannot, like, let any new legislation about guns go through. Guns don't kill people, people kill people, and the Second Amendment, da 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 da, boom, stop the conversation. And to me, it's like, well, either position can be unreasonable. It's like if it's ruled by the passions, we need to kind of cool the jets of emotions and then look at this more objectively and say, what can we do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's something that we miss a lot um, in our day of politics is realizing that there are pros and cons to both sides of the argument that there's, there's good things and bad things about each argument. And usually the more extreme we get, um, the more problematic those arguments get and the, uh, the more unreasonable we seem to be and the more unwilling we seem to be to compromise. Right, um, right, yeah. So we have, to, we have to learn somehow to meet in the middle or else, or else it doesn't really seem like we're gonna get anywhere. Exactly, we're, we can't move forward if extremes on the left and right hijack the narrative and you, you, there, there's no compromise, there's no middle way, like what is the middle way? What's the middle path? Where is compromise? But you're not gonna find compromise if you get on the extremes and just plant your flag and say, you know, no, we're not going to. It, we'll never move forward. And it's like we collectively have to say enough is enough and frankly, I think most people are more in the middle. Like extremists by definition are on the extremes. And I see both extremes as problematic. And I don't want to finger point and say, well, the left is more at fault or the right's more at fault. If you're in an extreme position, once you get there, you have closed your mind to other possibilities. You've, you've planted your flag and there's less flexibility when you're on the extremes. And that's, you know, what I, and what we've talked about is how a, a purpose in life is growth and improvement. And we have to be flexible to do that. And so on an individual basis, we need to be flexible and as a nation, we need to show some flexibility to improve as a nation. And to say there's no room for improvement on gun safety and reducing the number of gun deaths, it just makes no sense to me. So that's why I'm like, okay, let's, let's all roll up our sleeves, cool the jets of emotions. Now we want to make space for those emotions, but in order to, to enact policies or come up with strategies, we have to calm down a little and look more dispassionately at the data and stuff. And that's where we have a problem is a couple decades ago with the Dickey Amendment, uh, a senator from Arkansas, they, uh, I guess, uh, spearheaded this, um, that there'd be an amendment that it's about like, uh, we, we couldn't use funds to research uh, gun deaths and to look at what policies could reduce gun deaths like the, it just stopped it in its tracks So if we did that with COVID We'd never have come up with a vaccine or ways to treat it, you know in order to Treat it and you got to understand it in order to understand it You got to study it and then you got to try some different things and see what works and what doesn't 
but that was stopped in its track. So we could not move forward with enacting policies or legislations that could improve the situation. Right. So we had this piece of legislation that basically prevents us from getting data on this issue and which will prevent us from being able to use that data to improve and make an informed decision. Right. And and that's, you know, I, I think what we need now and the the thing that I, I understand uh, from the rights perspective, you know, we have the Second Amendment, you know, right to bear arms, and I, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole about, you know, well, what exactly does it mean to, you know, was it form or maintain a well-regulated militia? And, you know, it's right. like, okay, Second Amendment's here, but we can still do something to improve gun safety while not tossing out the Second Amendment. And, you know, some people say, well, Cars kill more people than guns. I mean, not by much, but yes. And we enact legislation to improve car safety. You know, there's, there's uh, roads, uh, traffic lights. They collect data on the, where are the hot spots on the intersections. You know, uh, airbags, seat belts, side airbags. We got, you know, th- uh, collision detection. You know, we improve and the number of automobile deaths per thousand miles or hundred thousand miles driven has gone way way down over time so you have more people on the roads more people driving but yet traffic uh, fatalities have gone down quite a bit overall and especially like per you know thousand miles driven or hundred thousand miles driven has gone way down because of these improved measures so if you think about guns like cars and traffic, it's like, mm-hmm. yes, we, we have done things to improve it. And the thing to me that starts to get in the way is this slippery slope argument. And I, I go back to something that I learned from the Dalai Lama, and I can't remember which book, uh, might have been The Art of Happiness. And he talked about when you're looking for truth, it's like looking for a lost object in in a room. If you de- decided, let's say, your keys have been lost and they're in the living room, then you will only look in the living room for your keys. But what if the keys are not in the living room? Well, we need to be open to that idea in order to ultimately find the keys. So when we're looking for truth, if we decide there is no way improving gun safety is part of the equation at all and we're only going to look at mental health we're going to look at school safety or whatever you know locks and protection then you've cut out a huge part of what could be a, a, a part of the solution and again it needs to be a we need to look at all aspects not just gun safety we need to look at everything but right my point would be that means everything <laughs> and yeah, gun safety. Yeah, if we leave one part out, like at this point we do need all the help that we can get. We do need to look at it from every angle we can. Um, another model that I've heard is like the, the Swiss cheese model where there's like each slice of the, the cheese, there's holes in it. Like no model is no model is perfect, no solution is perfect in terms of whether it's like the mental health side of the argument or the gun safety side of the argument but with those layered over each other soon enough those holes start to get covered up mm. and I like by that. combining those the, the aggregate effect is a lot stronger than yeah. just one of them individually yeah you have a, a big hunk of cheese that you you know you can't see through the holes anymore because you, you fill exactly. them in with the other slices yeah I like that exactly. and, and to think well, yes, mental health is, is part of the uh, thing we need to address. It's part of the conversation. But, you know, England and other countries, they have similar mental health issues, but yet they still don't have near the number of, you know, uh, gun deaths as, as we do in America. And then you right. have things like, well, 
you know, to get a driver's license, you have to take courses and you have, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, like the Spider-Man movie says. And a gun is very powerful. So with that power comes a great responsibility. And I think if you're a responsible adult that doesn't have a history of violence or, or serious mental health issues, then, you know, access to firearms can be there. But like, I think most people would agree if someone's got a history of violence and, you know, flying off the handle, a long criminal record, or um, people who are on FBI's no-fly list because of suspected they might be a terrorist and they can still go buy a firearm, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Or, you know, arguably, it, you're not, as an 18, 19, or 20-year-old, responsible enough to go buy alcohol. Mm -hmm. <laughs> any legally but yet you can buy an AR-15 or, or whatever uh, that you know it's like well there's some wiggle room there and even some states I believe Wyoming is one ha has its uh, 21 and up um, Florida has some safe so we're not talking about controlling everything we're just how can we improve safety and sometimes there's some low-hanging fruit, you know, that some small changes could lead to some big impacts. And if we reduce the number of mass shootings by 10%, that, that's worth something. Or the aggregate number of deaths, if we went down from 45,000 a year to 35,000, that's huge. That's 10,000 more people living that might not have lived had we not enacted some gun safety legislation. So I just think the Republicans, Democrats need to roll up their sleeves, get together, maybe have a bipartisan panel that looks at this and they, they, they talk to the leading researchers and experts. Maybe they do some pilot tests with different, you know, safety measures. They look at other countries and what they do. And that we just start like looking at it and then we collect the data, we see what works, what doesn't, and you know, we can still have the second amendment. It's not about tossing that out. And that slippery slope argument is circling back to that. To me, that, well, we can't enact any gun safety legislation because once you start pretty soon the government will be knocking on your door or barging through your door taking all your firearms. It creates this false dichotomy of either you're at the top of the slippery slope or once you take one step on it, which represents any gun safety legislation, you will slide all the way down to the bottom. And the bottom of a slippery slope represents your worst fear. And when we're living in fear, it's going to motivate us to do everything we can. The alarm bells go off. And so then people are like, no, 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 we're not going to do any gun safety legislation because it's going to lead to the bottom of this slippery slope. That's the part that I'm like, no, no, life doesn't work on slippery slopes. If we, if we look at our own experiences, like when was the last time you slid down to the bottom of a slippery slope? You know, it rarely ever happens. It rarely like happens. Our worst fears are, are usually pretty irrational. Right. Our worst fears, and which is what the bottom of the slippery slope is. And, you know, that you can make a slippery slope argument out of almost any decision we make and say, right. well, wait a second. Before you go forward with that decision, it could lead to this horrible outcome. So therefore, don't move forward on that decision. Like my middle son, who's a teenager, is starting to play guitar, and he's played piano for a while, but he really likes guitar. And, you know, someone could say, well, you don't want him to start playing guitar because then he might form a band. And if he forms a band, then he's going to be in that rock and roll lifestyle. And what will happen is he'll start smoking dope, he's, you know, be, or doing other substances, drinking, you know, that rock and roll lifestyle, sex, drugs, rock and roll, that's what it's about. So he's going to do that. Then he's going to fail out of high school. He's going to be, 
living in a dingy apartment with his bandmates and just playing for beer money because most bands don't make it big and he'll move on from alcohol and pot to heroin and he'll overdose and die so therefore you don't want him to take guitar lessons and it's like what you know like how are you jumping all the way to yeah. overdose by heroin now we could argue that does happen but that's sure. a worst fear scenario and you could see how you could create that out of almost any decision we make of you know, stepping out the door and driving our car. It's like, well, you know, you could get in an accident and die, so therefore don't drive your car because people do die in car. Right, well, what am I, are we going to live in a cardboard box or, you know, or in our house or, you know, just under the covers? Uh, you know, so we have to live our lives, and to do that, we can't live them based on always thinking of what's the worst thing that could happen to us. So that slippery slope argument, I do not like, and that's what happens often when we talk about any gun safety legislation is people start looking at a slippery slope and go right to the bottom of their worst fears, and then that stops everything and it's tracks. But that's an artificial dichotomy of top of the slippery slope or bottom, and life does not work in slippery slopes, or rarely, rarely does, you know. So we, we have to say, yeah, worse, you know, terrible things happen, but we can't always live like that. And so when we're looking at enacting some form of legislation or coming up with some compromises, it's like, let's take the slippery slope out of it and just look at what are some reasonable measures we could come up with and again like bipartisan I don't know the answers but the, the answer is do nothing that's not it can't be the answer same old same old right right it seems like we have to change something right we, we really have to and we have to be willing to meet in the middle and like you said we can't really operate based on our worst fears like if we're thinking that oh if we if we make background checks a little bit stricter, then they're just going to want to make it more strict and more strict until we have no gun rights at all. Right. Or that's that's the kind of the mindset of if we give them an inch, they'll take a mile. Exactly. And on the other side too. Right. With uh, you know, with with us uh, loosening up gun rights. Right. Um, it's it's the same thing. It's not specific to one side. Right. Yeah. This will lead to this, which will lead to this, which will lead to this, and it's just a straight connecting the dots all the way down to the bottom reminds me of the kids book if you give a mouse a cookie it's like oh if you do that then it's going to lead to this 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 and this and you go all the way down exactly. to this crazy scenario at the end you're like whoa 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 let's you know let's let's cool our jets and um you know i we've got to do something but something doesn't mean be rash and just do anything without like a careful deliberation and bipartisan think tank or whatever something like that and I think that's what America has to do we're too great of a country to do nothing and to let these numbers keep going up with us throwing up our hands and saying well nothing can be done yes things can be done we can put our minds to this we can come up with ideas that's how we solve all sorts of problems we sent people to the moon, you know, in, in such a short amount of time in the 60s, uh, in the space race, it's like we put our minds to stuff, we can do unimaginably great things. And I think reducing deaths by guns in America is definitely something we can make headway on if we can only get out of our own way and work together on this. So that's where Absolutely. I stand. Well, that concludes this episode. I know we're not here to solve all problems, but the solution to all problems is, is some sort of flexibility, approaching them flexibly and compromising. And that's what the Reasonably Good Life is about. And the sign off, as always, be curious, be flexible, be kind, and for goodness sakes, be reasonable. Thanks so much for joining us today and hope to see you in the next episode of The Reasonably Good Life. Have a good one.